I wonder if any of you got tricked this uh, week by an April Fool's joke. There's a, um, a podcast that I listen to sometimes where uh, youth pastors share stories of crazy things that happened when they used to be youth pastors, and I find it quite uh, amusing because it's all very realistic and has some sort of parallel to my former life. And uh, they posted an April Fool's joke this year that they decided after much consideration to stop the podcast, even though they've been uh, roaring to success after success. And 1,200 people stopped following them. So, oh, well... That, not, that podcast is over, unfollow that account. And then they started freaking out because their uh, April Fool's joke had been a little bit too successful and they were losing followers left, right, and centre. Joke, that joke was on them. Or perhaps you saw the uh, Pulse news site. I don't know if you follow them, the Tasmanian sort of social media news. Uh, and they uh, had, a, had a story uh, about how to go with the world's biggest chocolate fountain, we were also going to get the world's biggest water park. I think they had a picture of Mount Wellington with a giant uh, water slides coming off it and uh, uh, very obviously uh, unbelievable. But I, I don't know about you, but when I log on to uh, the internet on, on April 1, I'm not always aware that that's the date. And the first couple of posts, I get really confused about what's going on and why these people say it. And then eventually I find one that's weird enough, like water slides coming off a mountain, and I go, oh, it's the 1st of April. I now understand the context of the things that I'm reading. That's just a small example of uh, uh, an important thing that we have to do whenever we're reading or trying to understand anything, which is understand the context. We have to know what it is that we're reading. Are we reading a news story or are we reading a joke? Are we reading a poem or are we reading history? And as we uh, spend uh, some time, we'll be having little breaks along the way, but basically for the next three months, working through the opening uh, stories of Genesis 1 to 11, uh, that's a really important point that we need to keep in mind. We need to think very carefully about what are we reading? What is the type of literature that we have before us. But of course, uh, I'm sure you are aware, if you've been around church at all, that Genesis 1 to 11 is a little bit controversial. There's all sorts of things in it that people like to argue about all of the time. So, in our reading today, God made the world in six days, and then on the seventh he rested. What's that all about? Uh, in a few chapters' time, we'll end up there eventually, God floods the entire world and keeps Noah alive on an ark. What's that all about? There's men and women who live in this uh, period who live for a very, very long time. 900 and something years, I think, for some of them. What's that all about? What are we supposed to make of all of this? How do we understand the literature that we have in front of it? How should we understand these chapters of the Bible? And these are not insignificant questions. Because whatever we are trying to understand here, what we need to realise is that, they are, that, that these chapters are teaching us truth. They are true and they are to be taken literally in the true sense in which they communicate to us. That is, they communicate to us true things that we must believe as Christians about creation, sin, grace, uh, God's sovereign power, things uh, that are vitally important for us to make any sense of the human story, of the scriptures, and of actually Jesus and what he's come to do for us that we've just remembered at Easter. But whatever conclusions we're going to come to as we make our way through, we need to make sure that we are getting the context right. Now, of course, Genesis 1 to 11 is not an April Fool's joke, far from it at all. But nor is it a scientific journal from uh, a 21st century scientist. 
we have before us God's inspired and inerrant word written by Hebrews many thousands of years ago and we must keep that in mind as we read this book. Let me also say that uh, the nature and uh, type of literature that we have before us is a difficult question and I was saying this as I was speaking on this subject in, uh, on Wednesday, uh, that there's a sense in which, in Genesis 1 to 11, there are a lot of questions which, in my life, at, all, at the ripe old age of almost 40, uh, with a Masters of Divinity behind me, uh, I still don't quite know what I think about some of these questions that come up in Genesis 1 to 11. That is, there are, there are certain things that are open questions for me, and I want to say that's okay that we don't have to actually nail down what we think necessarily about all the possible questions that come up when we read this. What we need to focus on is what's the point and what is God trying to communicate to us. So whatever conclusions we might draw, uh, let me say that uh, uh, unless they're going to the fundamental truths of what the story is teaching us, we are free, I think, to have a little bit of uh, diversity amongst uh, our uh, conclusion drawing about what we think is going on in these opening chapters. But though there's uh, many open questions and things that I don't have all the answers to, and uh, maybe you do, and you maybe we'll swap out and you can start preaching the series uh, for me, um, we do have a lot that we do know. And there is a lot, as I've said here, that is true and that is literal. Uh, uh, And I I want us to uh, uncover that. So, uh, we've got Genesis 1 before us. Let's dive in. It should be on about page one-ish of the the Bibles uh, in uh, the uh, church chairs, if you want to follow along. Now, of course, uh, the controversial part of this whole story is that God speaks the world into existence. That's not that controversial. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. But the, the, the actual occurrence of that happening is in six days. Over six days, we go from... Uh, uh, we, we have a, the world in which we sort of now live. So how is it that we're to understand this six-day creation? Uh, There's a few different ways, but I want to say that, broadly speaking, you can divide it into three takes on on what to make of the six days. First of all, you've got uh, what people describe as young earth creationists. These are people who take a literal six-day reading of the text, and they say that God said he created the world in six days, and God can do that, And that means that's what happened. And if we track the people who uh, appear in the story from Genesis 2 onwards, starting with Adam and Eve, uh, that means God did this approximately 6,000 years ago. And that's what the Bible says, and therefore that's how it is. You've then got another group of people who take a similar but slightly more Uh, nuanced view than that, they say uh, that uh, a day is but a thousand years to God and that what we have before us is uh, uh, six eras in which God created things. Uh, So they they take the scientific understanding that the world's however many uh, million years old or more, uh, and they say, that's fine, that doesn't under- change what we understand Genesis to be saying. Uh, it said days, but it might have meant eras, the, it's six eras of creation, um, but uh, we're definitely not accepting uh, any evolution in our uh, understanding of things. That's an old earth creationist. And then you've got people who take a theistic uh, evolution approach, which is that actually what scientists have discovered is a process for uh, how God has created the world uh, and um, God still made the world, but he was, he was in charge of the evolutionary uh, processes. Uh, and then 
it gets a bit awkward because it has to figure out what it's going to do with Adam and Eve, that view, uh, and they don't really, in my view, have a great solution. So, uh, they're, broadly speaking, the three approaches that people can take when they're trying to figure out uh, whether what to make of the six days of creation. And I wonder what it is that you think. Well, I want to suggest that to figure out whether we should be young earth creationists, old earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, or something else completely, we first need to think, what do we have before us in Genesis 1? Is this an April Fool's joke? What kind of literature is this? Is it a scientific paper? Is it a newspaper story? Or is it something else? And it's possibly a bit obscured to us as modern readers, but to the uh, original readers and those uh, uh, proficient in Hebrew, it would be very obvious to them that what's before us is a beautiful piece of poetry. John Dixon says, the original Hebrew of this passage is marked by intricate structure, rhythm, parallelism, chiasms, repetition, and the lavish use of number symbolism. And these features are not observed together in those parts of the Bible we recognise as historical prose. What he's saying is, what we read actually gives us a clue as to how we're meant to start thinking about it. And I just want to show you uh, one of those sort of chiastic um, uh, poetic structures that exists as you read the story. On day one, we get light and dark. On day two, we get sky and sea. On day three, we get land and vegetation. So we've got those three things. And then they get sort of filled in the next three days. So light and dark on day one gets filled with the sun and moon in day four. The sky and sea in day two gets filled with the fish and birds in day five. The the land and vegetation in day three gets filled with the animals and humans in day six. It's like, it's if you will, you've got day one and day 1A, day two and day 2A, day three and day 3A if you were going to break it up as a bit of a, a sort of, a, to, to understand the structure. Not only that, uh, but to uh, quote from uh, some scholars again, uh, the number seven, which of course is the, uh, the Hebrew number for perfection, is used in a remarkably symbolic way throughout this uh, chapter. And let me again just read to you from uh, one of John Dixon's articles on this chapter. He says, in Genesis chapter one, the multiples of seven appear in extraordinary ways. For ancient readers who are accustomed to taking notice of such things, these multiples of seven conveyed a powerful message. Seven was the divine number, the number of goodness and perfection. Its omnipresence in the opening chapter of the Bible makes it an unmistakable point about the origin and nature of the universe itself. Consider the following. The first sentence of Genesis 1 consists of seven Hebrew words. Instantly, the ancient reader's attention is focused. The second sentence contains exactly 14 words. A pattern is developing. The word earth, one half of the created sphere, appears in the chapter 21 times. The word heaven, the other half of the created sphere, also appears 21 times. God, the lead actor, is mentioned exactly 35 times. If you're not real good at maths, by the way, 21 and 35 are multiples of seven. Uh, I I, I did have to just think about that for a moment when I was reading this. Uh, And the refrain, and it was so, which concludes each creative act, occurs exactly seven times, which is a multiple of one. Uh, And the summary statement, God saw that it it was good, also occurs seven times. It hardly needs to be pointed out that the whole account is structured around seven scenes or seven days of the week. The artistry of the chapter is stunning and to ancient readers unmistakable. It casts the creation as a work of art, sharing in the perfection of God and deriving from him. So 
that's just useful uh, information to have as we're trying to figure out what are we meant to take out of this passage, isn't it? But it's also useful to think about the context, not only how it was written, but what, what it was written in amongst. And it was written in amongst the ancient Near Eastern peoples where there were other creation stories that spoke of the world in more chaotic uh, and uh, disordered ways than Genesis 1 does. That spoke of the world created as a result of gods at war, where there's chaos and disorder and many gods involved. So to read from another Old Testament scholar, John Walton, he says, in the ancient Near East, the gods created for themselves. The world was their environment for their enjoyment and existence, and people were created only as an afterthought when the gods needed slave labour to help provide the conveniences of life. In the Bible, the cosmos is created and organised to function on behalf of the people that God planned as the centrepiece of his creation. That's a clue, isn't it, to what we're supposed to start drawing out of this uh, chapter. And in Genesis, uh, and he goes on, Walton, in another part, as he reflects on this opening chapter, to say, in the creation accounts from Mesopotamia, an entire population of people is created, already civilised, using a mixture of clay and the blood of a slain rebel god. This creation comes about as the result of conflict among the gods and the god organising the cosmos had to overcome the forces of chaos to bring order to his created world. The Genesis account portrays God's creation not as part of a conflict with opposing forces but as a serene and controlled process. In response to all these other creation myths out there trying to make sense of the world in which the people lived at the time, God speaks through his word and gives to them this opening chapter of the scriptures which tells us that God is in charge, that God is a God of purpose and order and that this world is no mistake and human beings are no accident. In fact, this world is good and God made it that way for his glory and for his purposes. Now, lest you think um, that I'm, uh, I'm trying to weasel out of uh, holding a literal six-day creation uh, because I'm trying to maintain Christianity in the face of science. Uh, let me... Uh, I think it's worth also saying that there's evidence in church history of smart people who are Christians who exist before Charles Darwin turned up and started talking about evolution, who who don't write their reflections and interpretations of Genesis 1 uh, in a way that required or even indicated that they took a, it to be a literal six days. That doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean you can't believe in a literal six days. It, it just means uh, that uh, if... It's not, it, it, it's not necessarily... This is not Christians deciding, oh, science is starting to beat the Bible. There, there were other views before uh, this became a, the big controversy that it is today. So, how old is the world? How long did it take to make? What are we supposed to believe about evolution? My suggestion to us today is that these are not the questions that Genesis 1 is setting out to answer. Now, we might be able to use Genesis 1 to try and answer those questions when we combine uh, uh, other facts that we've observed in the natural world uh, and come to some sort of conclusion about what we believe to be the right answer to how old the world is and how long it'll take to make and whether or not we think evolution is true. And I want to suggest you actually can arrive in any of the following, you can, any of those uh, places that I outlined at the start. You, you, you can take the information we've got in Genesis and you can take your understanding of geology and um, uh, whatever other sciences there are, biology and 
Mark, you can go and talk to Mark later about how the rocks work or whatever, uh, and you, you can come to a literal uh, six-day young earth creationist position or an old earth creationist position or a theistic evolutionist position, and you can think about how it is and why uh, you want to hold those positions and what the strengths and weaknesses of those positions are. But I want to suggest that whichever position you arrive at, you're actually playing a second order speculation game which is and trying to answer the question which genesis 1 is not trying to answer it's not that it it's not that those questions aren't important it's just that there are more important questions to go back to john dixon who writes a great article which i can give you later on this whole uh, question he says, I do not believe that Genesis 1 teaches a six-day creation, but that is neither an endorsement of theistic evolution nor a denial of six-day creationism. It is simply a literary and historical statement. I'm happy to leave the science to the scientists. So I guess what I want to say is there are going to be people in our church who hold strongly to six-day young earth creationism or old earth theistic uh, crea uh, old earth crea young creationism or theistic evolution and we can have conversations in the church about which one of those positions we think uh, makes the most sense and I don't really know um, I I'm not a scientist uh, and I'm not too concerned about what happened a long time before I turned up. Uh, what I am concerned about, though, is what God is trying to teach us through this scripture. And uh, I will just say one other thing, because uh, uh, Andrew will be preaching on uh, Genesis 2 next week, but I, I do think it's important to say that whatever we do, uh, position we do arrive at, I think believing in Adam and Eve as real people who God creates uh, is pretty important uh, and probably not up for debate. Um, so, and you, so we do need to fit that in, but... More on that next week from Andrea, not me. Whew. Uh, <laughs> um, so, let's be charitable in our uh, holding on to trying to think about things that happened at minimum 6,000 years ago, perhaps hundreds or millions of years ago. So what are the questions that Genesis 1 is trying to answer? What is it that we need to walk away from this with? Well, very quickly, because I've been going for a long time. We need to remember that God is the supreme creator and source of all. In Genesis 1, chapter 1, the first thing the Bible tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is in control. God made us. He made us with purpose and uh, with a plan. He created us by his word, God said it turns up over and over and over again. And when he said it, it's made. And when he looks at what he said, and that is, he's spoken into existence, it's good. God is in charge. God made everything. And everything that was made was made good. Because God is a good God. We get to the end of creation in Genesis 1 verse 31 and we read God saw all that he had made and it was very good there was evening there was morning the sixth day God's perfect creation he can sit there and look at humanity uh, given order uh, given authority to rule over the earth and he sits back and goes this is good stuff yeah I have done a wonderful thing I have made a good world We can also see that humans are special. That humans have a vital role to play in God's created world. Now, I don't want to major on this too much because you might remember if you were here back in October 
I preached uh, on Genesis 1 as part of our identity series, and in that, uh, I spent a, a whole 20 minutes talking about basically what Genesis 1 teaches us about our, our identity as human beings. But what is clear, as you read Genesis 1, 26 through 31, is that humanity is not like the rest of creation. We are different. We are made in God's image. We are made male and female. We're made to make more humans, to increase and multiply and fill the earth. And we're made to rule over the earth under God and to continue to bring about God's creative purposes and order to the world that he has made so good. And of course, that's the great human tragedy, isn't it? That in Genesis 3, it only takes us a few days and we stuff it up. So, God is the sovereign creator of the universe. There is no doubt. He made this world on purpose and he made you and me with purpose. He made us to be in relationship with him and to look after and enjoy the world which he has made. And you can enjoy, as part of the wonderful gift that God has given you as a human being made in his image, the scientific theories and the uh, speculation about the exact processes by which God did this and the exact time frame in which he did it. And you can do that, I think, without worrying about where you land or whether you never really quite know what to make of it all. Because I think what we have before us is a beautiful piece of poetry which is telling us something really, really important about God's creative plans and purposes for the world and for each of us. God made us, he wants to be in relationship with us and he wants us to look after his world. What you make of six, that the six days of creation is up to you, but let me just say one, more, one last thing. Uh, let's uh, try and uh, be, be um, uh, charitable in our positions on what we make of those six days so long as who, what we're making of them is a uh, an honest attempt for us to try and redeem the ultimate truths from the story that God is trying to teach us here in Genesis chapter 1 about his true nature and the importance of us as his ambassadors in the world. Amen. Amen.